Hello, history fans. Welcome back. I'm your graduate historian, and we will continue on with video three of the AP US History Overview. Again, just a reminder, this is meant to be an overview of AP American History. Certainly isn't going to cover everything that could be on the test, but it will try to hit the highlights. So this video covers the topic of the beginnings of a modern American democracy, covering base roughly the years from 1800 to 1848. So when we last left off, we had seen that American politics had become truly partisan with the beginning of the two-party system with the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. And in the election of 1800, in the first of many disputed elections, for anybody who thinks that's a new phenomenon in American politics, nope, no, I don't think so. Thomas Jefferson was elected the third president of the United States. So Jefferson uh, was a marked contrast from the Federalists of George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. He believed in the small yeoman farmer would truly be the best citizen and would truly establish a righteous democratic republic. The two biggest achievements uh, of the Jeffersonian era is, uh, of course, the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon in 1803 that almost immediately doubled the size of the country, and Alma took the United States territory across the Mississippi up to the uh, remaining Spanish territories in the New World, and continued troubles with England. Again, uh, it doesn't go into a great deal of detail, uh, but of course, American foreign policy throughout this era, through uh, 1815, in fact, was driven by Europe's now series of Napoleonic Wars. So Jefferson was continuing to try to keep Washington's neutrality, um, mostly by launching trade embargoes against Britain and France, which of course had a very bad effect on the American economy and started to cement the first sort of regional factionalism in the United States as the New England states, who were hardest hit by this cutoff of trade, grumbled quite a bit. But the British and French continued to interfere, of course, with American trade with each other, and, and the British started to impose what they called a series of impressment of American seamen, stopping American ships on the high seas, looking for British Royal Navy deserters who could, might, or might not be American citizens, and removing them and taking them back to the British Navy. Jefferson never really dealt with this particular situation, but he was able to avoid outright war with England. When James Madison succeeded him as the fourth American president, he, the problems and challenges with Britain continued to build not only the impressment of American seamen, but the interference with American trade. And of course, the British started, who ruled Canada at this time, started stirring up the Western Indian tribes. So in 1812, a group of what are called war hawks convinced uh, Madison to go to war with Britain. Now, this war not glossed over pretty quick in the book. It is one of America's truly forgotten wars, mostly because it was, it was a, uh, to use a phrase, it was a mess. The United States was ill-prepared for war, lost most of the battles, um, suffered um, horrendous uh, disruption of their trade as the British blockaded America, and the, the war ended with one American victory, true outright American victory, at the Battle of New Orleans, when an American force led by Andrew Jackson held off the British invaders. This had the effect of uh, catapulting Jackson to national prominence, but unknown to the troops that won the battle at New Orleans, a peace treaty between America and Britain had already been decided. So the war was really established the status quo. It stopped the British impressment of seamen uh, from American merchant ships, but it didn't really, and it gave America a new sense of self-respect, but was for the most part a uh, indecisive war that the only two real significant outcomes are it was, it was the end of the ability of the remaining Indian tribes east of the Mississippi to stop 
the expansion of settlement and it increased American manufacturing capability as the Americans uh, economy found itself cut off, cut off from Europe up until the final defeat of Napoleon in 1815. Madison was succeeded by James Monroe, who's really the last of the colonial uh, era presidents. Uh, Monroe, as a very young man, served in the Revolutionary War. So he was, in a sense, the last of the Revolutionary War era statesmen or veterans to serve for presidents. Uh, after the War of 1812, there was a great expansion of the American economy, of course, because now Europe was at peace as well with the final defeat of Napoleon. So this is sometimes called the era of good feelings. They didn't last very long. Um, the one significant, again, foreign policy thing that came out of the Monroe presidency was the establishment of the Monroe Doctrine. This um, was, in a sense, America's first assertion of its power in the Western Hemisphere as the former Spanish and uh, the one Portuguese colony of Brazil started to achieve independence from Spain, the American government felt that it was in their best interest to keep any other colonial powers from trying to come and reestablish colonies in South or Central America. So the Monroe Doctrine continues to be a driving force in American foreign policy. However, the issue of slavery started to rear its ugly head um, as the economic divide between the North and the South started to become more prominent throughout this era. The Southern states, of course, were heavily driven by plantation agriculture, cotton, tobacco, and other large cash crops that required large population of slave laborers to turn a profit versus the increasing industrialization of the New England and upper, mis upper Midwestern states, mostly New England, and the establishment of the great farm states on what would become known as the Great Plains. So in 18, so the entire political establishment was meant to maintain a rough balance of power between slave states and free states to placate the fear, the growing fear of the slave states that somehow the federal government would would um, attempt to interfere with the institution of slavery. The first of these was the Missouri Compromise. I am going to assume you'll spend a little bit of time in class. This basically said that Missouri would, make, would come into the Union as a slave state, Maine would come into the Union as a free state, thereby maintaining a parity of free state and slave state senators in the Senate. It also attempted to deal with the growing issue of as the United States states acquired more territories that were not states yet, but they were moving towards statehood, would these be free or slave states? The Missouri Compromise basically drew a line across the map of the Louisiana Purchase and said that all of the states, all of the territories north of this line would be free and the ones uh, south of this line would be slave states. This was followed by the election of 1824. Again, if you think that uh, you know we've had a lot of recent controversies about election, the election of 1824 was actually the first and only election to date that has been actually where none of the candidates received a majority of the electoral votes, and it was decided by the House of Representatives. Historians now know that there was a great deal of backroom wheeling and dealing. Andrew Jackson probably actually won the election, but because of the backroom dealings, hmm, the election was given to John Quincy Adams. Keep in mind, Andrew Jackson with his personality never forgot this. But John Quincy Adams, who was of course the son of John Adams, they were the first father-son duo to serve as presidents. John is the second, John Quincy as the sixth, and John uh, Quincy Adams had a fairly unremarkable presidency. And then Jackson took over in 1828. Now we see the true emergence of, we'll just call it dirty partisan politics in 1828. Again, not a new phenomenon for those of you that somehow believe it is. Let me dispel you of that notion. Again, our ancestors could pretty much give lessons to anybody these days on how to really do backroom deals. Anyway. Jackson was a truly Western president. He was uh, what you would term, I suppose, a populist these days. Um, he was a very sort of not, I would say, refined gentleman. He actually did con 
participate in a couple of duels in his life. Uh, you did not want to mess with Andrew Jackson, just saying. Um, a couple of significant issues with, with, uh, that came up during Jackson's presidency. The first was the final removal of a number of Indian tribes from the southeastern United States. This was the uh, infamous Trail of Tears that moved what were called the five civilized tribes, the Cherokees, Chickasaws, Choctaws, Seminoles, and um, I don't remember the other one, to be honest, but I'm sure they're in your book, to what became the Indian Territory, now the great state of Oklahoma, from which your grouchy historian comes from. Um, and of course, the concept of nullification. So during Jackson's presidency, we have the first, again, a growing sectionalism in the country, highlighted by a series of tariffs instituted by the Congress, which are basically taxes on imports to help protect the growing American industrial base against cheap imports. This set up the first of a number of crises um, between the northern and southern states. The northern states becoming increasingly industrialized were in favor of very high tariffs to protect their infant industries. The southern states wanted very low tariffs because tariffs, of course, raised the cost of manufactured and consumer goods that, of course, the southern states didn't manufacture for the most part themselves and had to purchase them. In 1832, this came to a head and the state of South Carolina said that they were not going to observe a recent tariff that had been passed that they called the Tariff of Abomination. Now, Andrew Jackson, although he was a southerner, came from Tennessee, had none of this and threatened to call out federal troops, as George Washington had done uh, 50 years earlier, to enforce the tariff. Imagine if the Civil War had broken out in 1832. However, like a great deal of American politics at the time, there was a compromised reach and the nullification crisis kind of faded away. But keep in mind, for those people that um, maintain the myth that the soon to follow civil war was because of tariffs, this is probably where that notion came from. It's not historically accurate, of course, but this was the first of a number of crises and uh, intense, uh, we'll say, regional disagreements between the northern states and southern states over tariffs. Now, the election of 1836, um, Jackson was a two-term president, of course. The election of 1836 brought about a new political party called the Whigs. The Whigs had basically one thing. They were opposed to the Democrats, right? We now had the Democrat Party, which was genuinely the first national political party that the United States ever had in the post-federalist area era, but the Whigs came to being, and they were a loose coalition of people that basically opposed the Democrats. They didn't necessarily have a, a platform of their own. Um, they would, as we'll see over time, sort of transform with a few other groups into the future Republican Party, but for the most part, they were simply opposed to things that the Democrats were for. As I mentioned, the economic growth continues to divide the country. This was an era of, of, of significant economic growth interrupted by occasional economic crises, mostly caused by monetary issues, speculation in the stock market, and other um, economic factors that you, you have with a growing economy that um, is, is heavily leveraged. Farmers, plantation owners typically had to use a great deal of credit until they were able to, to harvest and sell their cash. So you had kind of a cycle going of credit and repayment, credit and repayment. And if anything happened to disrupt that cycle, you had an economic crash. Now, this is also the time of a great deal of inventions driving the economy. Again, it's kind of hard for us to understand because we're used to um, technology changing at a very rapid rate. And we kind of ho-hum, you know, another new iPhone, another new Android. But the technological changes that came about in the, in the first half of the 19th century really shouldn't be understated because they were just as remarkable and had just a prof as profound an effect on not only the economy, but society that the internet, smartphones, Wi-Fi have on us. Steamships, railroads, and the telegraph allowed to allow uh, farmers and merchants and manufacturers to transport goods and people faster, cheaper, and safer. And the telegraph began to bind the country together. You now have the ability to have 
not quite national news, but instead of newspapers taking days or weeks, they now took hours and days for a news story to travel all across the country. And of course, you have two uh, of the most significant uh, inventions, I'll call them, of the era. The first being the cotton gin, right? It was generally assumed by, I think, the founding fathers that slavery as an institution was very likely to die off, not for humanitarian reasons, of course, we'll be br brutally honest, because that's what I am, but because it wasn't economically viable to have large numbers of slaves in a, the, the old plantation economy. What changed all of that was the cotton gin. The cotton gin allowed cotton growers to, um, if you've ever actually seen raw cotton, it has these little seeds in it that you have to separate these seeds out from the cotton in order to have raw cotton that you can send to market. This, of course, was a very labor-intensive process, and this is why they had large numbers of slaves, was to pull, literally pull these seeds out of the cotton. Eli Whitney's cotton gin, and of course, Eli Whitney invented both of these concepts. Eli Whitney's cotton gin, you threw the cotton gin, the cotton in the gin, you turned the handle, it separated the seeds, boom. So you could now grow, harvest, and prepare a lot more cotton for a given number of slaves. This, of course, now made cotton the primary cash crop of the South and increased the need for slave labor to grow, harvest, and market it. Interchangeable parts, of course, also gave rise to factories because now you could have an industrial setting where you could mass produce different products. Good for the economy, generally good for consumers, but of course it also caused the rise of cities and the, the growing issues that we're going to see for the next 50 years of the struggles between labor and management. Agriculture across the board also grew. The Midwest, of course, became the nation's breadbasket. As I noted in the world history um, review, what this helped drive was increasing productivity in agriculture. So you didn't need as many farmers, although the American economy and American society was still heavily rural and agricultural, but you didn't need as, need as many farmers to feed people as you did in the old days. So as things like the uh, reaper and other uh, we just call them primitive farm equipment came about, the United States was not only able to feed themselves, but we became a food exporting country. But again, the role, the rise of the economy also aggravated economic and social differences. As we've discussed before, there's issues of slavery, tariffs, and the always never ending discussion of the Benjamins, the money, the banks, right? Alexander Hamilton had tried to have a United States bank. There was a, the, an attempt to revive a United States bank during this era. This was extremely controversial. The issue, of course, was who has, um, who should have the, the ability to make loans. The Constitution, of course, gave the, the government the, the sole authority to coin money. But the question was, how, do you, how much money should you have in circulation? The eternal struggle through the 19th century of paper money versus hard currency, gold or silver, would rear its ugly head pretty much for the rest of the century. But America also headed west. As I mentioned earlier, the Louisiana Purchase, made by Thomas Jefferson in 1803, doubled the size of the United States and helped complete the settlement east of the Mississippi. This is when you're probably going to hear the first phrase, manifest destiny. Americans believe that the United States should eventually go from sea to shining sea, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And as we'll see a little more in the next video, the territory gained by the United States at the end of the Mexican War made that reality come true. It's kind of interesting to note that the United States settled from the East Coast to the Mississippi, then ran around to the West Coast and settled Oregon and California, and then finally met in the middle in the Plains States. But the cities and trade centers out to the Pacific, you'll see the very beginnings of the notion that the United States was going to eventually become a country all the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The Americans settle in Texas and achieve independence from Mexico. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next video, but you will see the very beginnings of the outline of the, the current geography of the United States today 
by um, about 1850 with the final settlements of disputes with England over the border between the United States and Canada and the final Gadsden purchase from Mexico to round out the current states of Arizona and New Mexico. As I mentioned, this growth of industry created a great deal of social changes in cities and towns. If you have the growth of a working class now, not only a, a working class, but a middle class of tradesmen and professionals, large, uh, uh, the large growth of working class families that didn't own property, didn't farm, they were wage earners, waves of immigrants from Ireland and Germany, right? People think that American, um, America's uh, issues with immigrants are, again, a new thing, new. No. The, uh, the American, the, the, the nativist, as the term was made at the time, the nativist sentiment against those, uh, those dirty Catholics from Ireland and uh, those dirty Eastern Europeans from Germany and the Eastern states uh, was very real during this time. And there was a great deal of um, discrimination against immigrants from Ireland and Germany. Slavery, of course, continued to drive the South. Again, you see throughout this era, leading up, of course, to the Civil War, to a hardening of positions on the pros and cons of slavery, the defense of slavery in the South, a growing abolitionist movement in the North. And you still have a very hard life along the frontier. Um, the Indian Wars east of the Mississippi were, for the most part, uh, settled by this time. Uh, on the Great Plains and the Southwest, they were just beginning as growing numbers of settlers started to move out into what would become the states of Nebraska, Kansas, the Dakotas, and up into Montana and Idaho. Again, as part of these, these social changes, there's a couple of other um, significant um, changes, I think, that we need to take into account. Here. First of all, is what's called the Second Great Awakening. This is another tremendous religious revival that took place uh, during this era, particularly focused on those evil vices of gambling and prostitution and also drinking alcohol. You see a rise of temperance societies, and of course, alcoholism was an issue at the time. And sort of a byproduct of the Second Great Awakening was encouraging women to take a greater role in religious life and new reform societies that started to take care of the forgotten members of societies. For example, prisoners, asylums for mentally ill people, and orphanages. And you had the very first Women's Rights Convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. However, the biggest movement at the time through this era is, of course, abolition. You have uh, two basic camps, moderates versus immediates. Uh, hopefully you will discuss those in your class. But you also have the beginnings of the Underground Railroad. As positions hardened between the North and the South on the issue of slavery and the rights of slaveholders, you'll see that one of the most significant things that, that slaveholders in the South wanted to pass were laws that allowed them to retrieve their runaway slaves from northern states. This is probably one of the areas where attitudes hardened the most. The northerners believed that once a slave achieved uh, getting into a northern state, that they should no longer be slaves. The southerners considered those slaves still property that had to be returned to them. We'll see more of this when we discuss the Dred Scott case in the next chapter. This issue probably just as much as, as the controversy over spreading slavery into the new territories is going to help lay the stage for the Civil War. All right, lots of terms and conditions. I put in here a couple of Supreme Court cases because they are probably two of the most famous Supreme Court cases, and I would not be surprised if they showed up on the test somewhere. This is Marbury versus Madison, which of course is the uh, most important case, I think, in terms of the Supreme Court, because it, gave, it was where the Supreme Court under John Marshall established the doctrine of judicial review. That is, it allowed the Supreme Court to rule on the constitutionality of a law passed by the Congress, which pretty much is how they spend most of their days today. McCullough versus Maryland also helped establish the primacy of federal law over state law. So again, this is a question that had been around since the very beginning 
of the Constitution, and McCulloch, McCulloch, McCulloch versus Maryland was one of those precedent-setting cases that established the primacy of, a, of federal law over state law. Again, uh, these other terms here, I think we uh, have covered a, a number of them. We're talking about the Compromise, the Missouri Compromise, the Compromise of 1820. The next great compromise, of course, is the Compromise of 1850 when California entered the, the Union. This, again, was a strengthening of, of what was known as fugitive slave laws that allowed the return of escaped slaves to their Southern owners. This was an extremely controversial uh, topic in the North and, again, was one of the primary uh, factors in the hardening of attitudes of slavery between the North and the South. Okay, so that concludes this video. The next video, there's gonna be a little bit of overlap as we head into the Civil War, so it's kind of a review, but the next video is gonna carry some of these themes forward into the Civil War. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, I hope it, you found it useful.